for example, expertise uh, or talents that we need to develop. And as well as at the end, uh, hopefully, if we make a kind of three round uh, discussions, and then uh, we could also discuss about the, the way to share knowledge itself is a kind of really a fundamental questions among us in a society so that we could uh, hope we could reach uh, at the uh, such kind of uh, uh, open ended uh, discussion. So first of all, I'd like to uh, ask all the, the university leaders to uh, give us some brief introduction and also what would be the kind of current status of, uh, of their uh, universities. So the, the, please start over from uh, Paul. Okay. Yeah. Maybe you have to. <coughs> Thank you for being here. And you have to, you know, Paul. Oops. You have to use this. Yeah. Okay. So thank you for being here and good morning. And uh, yeah, I just want to start also by <coughs> saying I hope that you share the sense that is on our campus very broadly that um, it's just a very um, kind of a joyful moment to see the possibilities of what learning can take place now, uh, as well as a moment, of course, of great responsibility. And it's got both of those characters uh, going. Uh, in our case. Um, we're certainly developing uh, uh, the areas of, uh, there's a lot of interest in making sure that the foundations of AI are understood well, and, and we intend to kind of grow our faculty in that area substantially. And then, you know, there'll be a few areas where uh, we'll make concentrated efforts to expand our knowledge and to grow our expertise. Uh, ethics, policy, and law uh, is an area we'll certainly be uh, developing, as well as um, the AI and science uh, uh, interface, uh, uh, and AI and medicine, and AI and finance and economics. Those are, those are kind of the theme areas that we're going to concentrate in. And uh, if I could just say one brief more additional thing, you know, you mentioned the chat GPT uh, moment. And for me as a scientist at least, uh, there was a similar moment, to, you know, maybe just a little bit before that, uh, which was when um, uh, the AlphaFold uh, uh, program came out, yeah. uh, which suddenly took uh, 180,000 uh, protein structures that had been collected laboriously over decades and then using the uh, techniques of, of AI, essentially solved the protein folding pro problem. <laughs> Definitively, yeah. a problem <laughs> which people had worked on for 50 years. Yeah. And I just remember looking at that when it came out, and it just was like, oh my gosh, this is so wonderful. I mean, all of a sudden, uh, this kind of knowledge can take place. And I, I think that's what suffuses our, our, our feeling at the moment, is that there are so many areas where there are problems we've wanted to understand for a long time, and now suddenly there's a set of tools that, that open those up. And they're in the different domains. And, and, and so that's a time of a lot of thinking inside the universities about how to organize that well and, and how to make that moment uh, very special. OK, so yeah, over to Kohei. Yes, yes um, at Keio University, um, we recently opened a space or <coughs> house called a Generative AI Lab. Half of the space is used for teaching. Half of the uh, space is used by our top AI uh, researchers to come together and work together. And this teaching space uh, are used by students because students are better in AI than other, most of the faculty members. So we are hire students to teach other students how to use AI and so on, and you know they're sitting right next to the right next room to the uh, the, the the state of art AI research uh, room, so they can go back and forth between them. And of course, this AI space is uh, sponsored by a number of companies, so, so so this is why we can hire students. But at the same time, uh, all the platform companies get to meet. Uh, really capable students, and sometimes you know, freshman students teach seniors or even grad students or to uh, even faculty members. So it's been very interesting. But uh, this is a time that those who are even high school students can really teach the university faculty members, and this interaction is very fruitful. So I'm so happy to be in the AI house um, with th that has very similar concept as mm -hmm. our uh, generative AI lab. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. So then, uh, Brian, please. Thank you. So uh, I'm from the Australian National University, and uh, we have been looking at the emergence of AI 
as a complex system uh, through the field and um, the foundation of uh, School of Cybernetics. And the head of that is uh, distinguished Professor Genevieve Bell, who's actually my successor as the president or vice chancellor of the Australian National University. So I'm going to be kind of channeling her here today, uh, <laughs> myself being a physicist. So clearly, AI is connected to the future of essentially every single discipline within our university. But as Ito has uh, said, it's complex because our students are better <laughs> at the technical details of AI than our staff, and it's changing on a year-to-year -year basis. But our staff are wise. And one thing we have learned, and I'll talk a little bit more about the cybernetics thing, is they are complex systems that are uh, we need to learn how to create a wisdom connected to the technology, and that is the thing that I see as lacking as we have this exponential growth of people wanting to use this for every problem imaginable, but the quality assurance part of it and the biases are really problematic, and we have sort of got the genie out of the bottle, and now we're going to have to try to put it back in in a more refined <coughs> way, and I think that's one of the things our university be working on. But again, it's essentially across every single college that we're having to do this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. So then, uh, NJ, please. Well, good, uh, good morning, and thank you for having me. Uh, I'll f AI is going to affect all aspects of our life, and particularly uh, the way we do things in higher education. So I'll just focus on two aspects in education. Uh, one is really uh, the pedagogy uh, in which uh, our professors uh, 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 teach. Uh, we think that is important and uh, it <coughs> has to change with the advent of AI. Right? Um, student level, we have made uh, sort of AI literacy course, computational thinking courses compulsory as part of general education. Uh, however, I think it is important for our professors mm -hmm. uh, to be able to measure up uh, uh, in terms of uh, teaching and in terms of leveraging on AI to teach all right, and to enhance their pedagogy. And that is one part which I uh, am trying to push. Uh, we have classes with professors uh, on how to use, for instance, ChatGPT, how to incorporate ChatGPT. Uh, but uh, we don't see actually a huge majority of professors actually coming on board. So that's the part on undergraduate. The other part uh, is on uh, continuing education. Um, we see actually uh, huge disruptions if AI is being leveraged on in society, especially in the workplaces. Um, our sense is that it's going to affect a huge uh, uh, a proportion of blue collar workers and it's going to hit the lower portion, the lower hierarchy of the white collar workers. So uh, at NUS, we're trying actually to also use university as a living lab. Uh, I have made AI literacy and uh, uh, data literacy courses compulsory for all my 5,000 admin stuff. Hmm. All right. And uh, we have actually uh, a pre-trained chat uh, GPT uh, framework where they can actually then leverage on chat GPT to use in their work. And uh, our hope is that how can we actually learn from this experience uh, and perhaps provide uh, new courses in continuing education for affected workers. Uh, thanks. Okay, thank you. So then, uh, yes, Irene, please. Great, thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. And thank you, yeah. uh, President Fuji, for organising this morning's session. It's really great to hear uh, from yeah. my colleagues, you know, what they're doing in their institutions. So at the University of Oxford and uh, more generally in the British higher education system, um, I guess the first thing to say is, you know, we're embracing it in a very positive way. I'm a scientist too by background, so some of the concepts behind AI uh, have not been unfamiliar to many of us, actually, well ahead of it, sort of taking the world by storm, notably through ChatGPT. So just to sort of say to Brian that there are some faculty members, of course, who are better than the students because they're actually generating yeah. the new AI or the future and the new algorithm. So we do have specialism uh, there. And, and of course, this session is very much focusing on the educative element mm -hmm. uh, and the teaching element of the university's role, as opposed to the 
the research element, which uh, would be another whole session in terms of, again, how we can incorporate it and think about, again, the challenges there for us in terms of our publishing and, and copyright and ownership of intellectual property. What we've done in the UK, and led very much by the Russell Group, which are the 24 uh, research intensive universities in the UK, is, is established very quickly, really driven by the chat GPT and catching everybody out and thinking, oh my God, what are we going to do about these students cheating in their exams in the summer? So very quickly brought out five guiding principles for us to incorporate. And so we've built all of us in our, generally in our universities, on those uh, five guiding principles. And it's the obvious <coughs> sort of things. How can we best, again, inculcate and teach our students how to responsibly use the different platforms that would be available to them? What are the ethical and some of the issues that they should be aware of? And teach them how to learn about where there are errors, where there are hallucinations, and really bring that to life mm -hmm. as part of the teaching. How can we skill up very quickly, as noted by everybody here, our staff who feel very nervous and very sort of disempowered that they're in a world that's very quickly moving, and they're with a classroom of students who are far more advanced than them, and, and they feel that that balance of not power, but just the normal didactic balance that would happen mm. in the classroom has shifted. So how can we make sure that they have the confidence to again uh, know how the students are using some of the algorithms and help guide them in terms of again uh, responsible use. And then all the way through to the sort of ethical implications as we know a lot of these, particularly the large language models, very much driven by uh, Western philosophy, diff different sort of the political and geopolitical uh, biases within them, the very mm. essence of the language that's being used. And again, making sure that our students are aware of that and are thinking about the ethical implications. So we've set up in Oxford a centre for AI and ethics, uh, mm. which is very much taking a short, medium and long-term approach to the immediate regulation that needs to be thought about in the context of responsible use of AI, all the way through to the deep thinking philosophical framework that needs to be established as humans in terms of how on earth are we going to live alongside this wonderful technology going forwards. Mm. So I guess in essence, you know, we've had big technological revolutions historically. This is not yeah. new, if I'm honest. Some people think of it as the, when the telescope came and it gave us that yeah. incredible tool to go out and look into the universe and, and explore that. This is a tool that's allowing us to do the same on data and information. And I often mm. say, uh, when I'm talking about this, if you remember a very eloquent quote by T.S. Eliot, uh, we should always remember, where is knowledge in all this information? So one of the things that we're great at at universities is curating knowledge, <coughs> developing knowledge uh, through our research and disseminating it through our teaching. Mm. Truth and knowledge is what we're all about. Content's going to be really important in these AI alg algorithms, and that's sort of, again, uh, a space that we're very comfortable with and familiar with in the university sector. So it'll be interesting to yeah. uh, hear more from my colleagues how they think about, again, those areas. Yeah, OK. <laughs> Thank you so much. So, so there, there are so many, I mean, different uh, approaches, but the, I mean, in general, so we are trying to understand what would be the uh, kind of outcomes of, out of this uh, new technology. And also, uh, everybody is uh, be, be aware of the, the uh, is aware of the kind of the importance of the ethics and uh, also the policy over the uh, involvement of this uh, new technology. And so then, uh, so I would like to go over to the second round discussion. And that is uh, to, uh, in the context of higher education. So what would be the important, uh, so in terms of what, do, what would be the important talents or expertise in terms of the, the kind of fostering students or new students or, or, or kind of work, the workforces in the future? And then, uh, so I would like to have uh, your uh, opinion from well. maybe in the same sequence. Is that okay, that we'll right? do the same yeah. sequence. Thank you. <coughs> Uh, boy, this has been interesting. I'm enjoying this enormously, just listening to colleagues and the different <laughs> parts that they're bringing out. Uh, um, but you know, our emphasis always um, is wanting to have students um, learn how to know, not what to know, <laughs> and and so you know, and and. Uh, to look at things from many different sides, to be able to look at problems from, mm -hmm. from many sides. But of course, there's been this enormous surge in students uh, taking the fundamental courses to understand how these tools actually work. So, so that's just kind of happening organically uh, at the university. Um, and and, and it's, uh, I think it, it will keep going that way. Um, but you know, maybe one point, I think it came out lightly here, but that I'd like to try to make for all of us a little bit, is that at these, I think at these institutions, one of the very likely outcomes, and we talked a lot about the students, is that um, 
they'll, you know, if two people sit down and use uh, chat GPT-4 or any of the other AI tools and try to learn something from it or to discover something from it, um, they'll bring different uh, results out. <laughs> they won't be exactly the same. Uh, because the ways in which they'll approach asking those questions to get the information out won't be identical, and the sequences that they follow won't be the same as well. <coughs> and, and as a consequence of that, I think what we'll see is that actually there'll be a group of people who will use these tools and take knowledge to a whole different level. And then, you know, there'll be others who kind of struggle with it and try to see how they can get something out of it that looks... Uh, that doesn't just look like something that just came out from a simple query. <laughs> and, and that, to me, is where I think our faculty are really trying to think about how do we um, guide students to be able to think in that way so that they become <coughs> the practitioners who use it at the absolute highest level. And, and, and connecting this then back to, I think, some of the things we'll come back to, presumably, um, what does that mean about... Um, how the very high end uh, of education uh, will move uh, with respect to uh, the uh, uh, education that's taking place more broadly in society. Uh, the, the, one of the concerns is that it will, it will, I mean, one of the joys is that it's gonna really elevate the most, uh, the highest level, uh, but it also could open up gaps even larger. It could accelerate those if we're not really thinking hard about that. Mm -hmm. So that's very much on our, our minds. Yeah. Okay, so go ahead, please. So traditionally, Japanese education uh, <laughs> focuses more on absorbing knowledge rather than asking questions. And uh, in this sense, uh, the KO is quite a unique system that actually we have not only university and graduate schools, but also we have all the way from elementary school, K-12 education all the way. Mm -hmm. so, so the chat GPT, emergence of the chat GPT is quite, uh, quite astonishing uh, because you can ask questions forever. You can keep asking questions to chat GPT, and you, 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 nev you never know whether you get the answer you're looking for or correct answer, but you know, that's a part of it. Because if you ask questions to your parents, sometimes your parents are wrong anyway. So, <laughs> so, so, so I tell them that you know, practice of keep asking questions, and uh, that's, uh, that actually will change the education in Japan quite significantly. And uh, also, of course, we need to really focus on bu building a model. It could be business model or educational model that actually will utilize uh, AI. So, so those are the two aspects that, that, that we're trying to focus uh, for the development of talent. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, then, uh, Brian? So, Within uh, the Australian National University, uh, the School of Cybernetics has been up and running for almost six years. So bringing together, by design, extremely diverse, and I mean like five continents, all sorts of disciplines, a group of master students and having that as a continual program over the last six years has sort of revealed some of the things that we know in detail, which is the systems um, for example, of, of the modern AI systems are very biased in a way that you really kind of need to be immersed with people who are not of your background to realize just how bad it is. And so having that some sort of uh, uh, a system of education where people become wise to the problems inherent in, in it, I think is going to be really important. Mm -hmm. The other thing that uh, our students find very important is that the whole development of AI goes back to you know, the early 1950s, and trying to see the historical progression actually provides people the ability to kind of process what's going on. Uh, and understanding the underlying system, who has the data, where's the data come from, how much electricity is it using? I mean, I think one of the things we forget about is if you do a, a, a query, it uses like 10,000 times more electricity than a normal Google query does, and there's gonna have limitations about how we do it. So understanding the system in detail is important. Uh, and in the end, uh, as an education program, I guess we have, as Irene said, the, the very specific development of 
the cutting edge techniques. Mm -hmm. And we're all focused on large language models right now, but there's gonna be a whole bunch of different ones that are gonna emerge over the next five, 10 years. And we need to get people both trained in the specifics, but my average student needs just to learn how the box is working, <laughs> right? Because the box is gonna keep changing. And so I think our approach is going to be to embed the education in every single degree within the context of that degree, not as a bolt-on AI module. Mm. It'll actually be, you're, a, you're an anthropologist, and you're going to learn how to use AI in the context of anthropology. Mm -hmm. I see. OK, so Enchai, please. Yeah. So um, when you look at learning, I think <coughs> largely, uh, and from observations of my, in my own university, uh, it's largely a lot of content delivery. Uh, there's less of the emphasis on teaching the students or encouraging the students to think, all right, critical thinking, uh, learning to learn, uh, uh, asking questions, and so on and so forth. So I'm reminded by uh, you know, what my PhD supervisor uh, advised when I first became a PhD student. I said, don't focus on the solution. Ask the right question, all right? And I think these are the sorts of skills that are needed more so with the event of AI. Mm. And uh, uh, the, the challenge, of course, is how do we get our professors uh, to focus more on this important foundational thinking skills, uh, uh, skills of connection, right? Uh, uh, joining the dots, uh, skills of critical thinking, uh, and to have them infuse in the assessments, in the discussions, and so on and so forth. Uh, you'll find that teaching is actually very complex. All right? uh, it's about teachers, it's about students, it's also about how you connect between the teachers and the students. So you have to have all three parts actually nice. Mm -hmm. I see, thank you. So then, yeah, Irene, please. Yep. Yeah, I don't wish to be facetious, but I think a challenge uh, for us is, are we going to be smart enough to actually use it? Um, so, so and, and why I say that is, of course, when it's at its best, it's releasing a huge amount of time. Why spend three days coding when you can just have it done in an instant? So it goes back to your point about it all becomes around the question. So already one seeing quite quickly, certainly with some of our physical-based scientists in Oxford, is the huge amount of time released because you don't have to do the grunt work as long as there's veracity and it's accurate and all the things that are still challenges for AI itself and all of us developing it and providing content. So let's assume that it's good and we've got through all the issues around it, it not being accurate, etc. Hmm. Then it's a question of, well, how smart are we to actually then have all that free time to think about what are the questions that we want to probe it with, what are the challenges that we need to step up and meet, whether that's in the biomedical space, you know, through to societal challenges, and how do we therefore mine this extraordinary rich data set because we're going to be released of huge amounts of time <laughs> on a time scale that we're, we're not yeah. used to as sort of social animals. Again, as I said, we've had technological revolutions, but we've had more time to sort of get used to them and live alongside them and adapt. This one's just hit us, and suddenly we're going to have a lot of time spare, and so we've got to get really smart. And, and that's a great, exciting opportunity, yeah. but I think that really is a challenge for us. And maybe if I could just add another challenge then, uh, sort of more at the earlier stage. We talk a lot, don't we, as sort of leaders of these great institutions about democratization of education and knowledge and the importance of that and how one does that notwithstanding that we're geographically placed and we all believe in the benefits of learning in that face-to-face -face environment because you learn a lot more around the subject uh, uh, with that proximity but we must also share that knowledge and that information and content that we have you know more globally through digital means and of course, the challenge I think for all of us is, is how do we curate and shape these platforms so that the content is true and reliable and not biased, the issues around plagiarism and all the things mm. that we worry about as academics and that we can teach our students about responsible use of are there, but how do we then get that out there into a, a broader environment without making the institutions that are already very um, capable even more sort of separated from those beneath. And I think that's a worry. So whilst there's this global opportunity for democratization, there is a risk, I think, as you say, of separating yeah. the good from the sort of um, medium. And that, that's something we need to think about. And that's a challenge, I think, for us. Right, yeah. 
Thank you so much. So I, I would, I mean, uh, like to discuss about all this, I mean, democratization of the education in the third round discussion. But uh, as a whole, it's uh, kind of, so most of you are uh, talking about your learn, how to learn, and then also the asking questions, and also how we could embed the, uh, this context of AI into uh, each of the disciplines and so on. So. Then uh, I would like to uh, go over to, sorry, uh, <laughs> just, just uh, like uh, last round. So we want to make a kind of brief also a comment from the, the speakers over this. Uh, so I, my concern is, uh, so this AI or new technology should be the way to uh, democratize the, the education. And also, uh, the, this would also make, if this technology could make a change uh, in our society, uh, on how to share uh, knowledge. So that might be uh, like, a we, if we look back to the, the printing press or emergence of internet or emergence of uh, social media and so on, then that definitely uh, uh, kind of uh, made changes in, in a way how we could share knowledge or how we could transmit knowledge. So that in, in this context, uh, what, so just a quick comment from uh, Paul, so please. So I want to come out, uh, you know, I think I said earlier, I think that the propensity of this, oops, <coughs> my, my concern is that the propensity just left on its own is that it will open gaps, uh, not, not narrow them. And uh, I, I, to be a little contrarian here, I would say one of the things that we're deeply involved in right now is a more local effort. It could perhaps happen globally. But we're deep into establishing a much deeper set of partnerships with the city colleges in Chicago, which are places where people uh, you know, who may not have been headed towards higher education are going or who have multiple jobs while they're trying to you know, make their way through. Uh, we have 7,000 undergraduates total, 13,000 grad students. Uh, the educational need in our region is, is vast. So we've been deep for some time now into trying to develop, and in, the, in, in this exact space, we have a set of um, uh, preceptors, the, the students at different levels who are going into uh, classrooms jointly with their faculties there and teaching in person uh, about these kinds of issues. And, and, and I just think that, you know, as you're saying, if you free up time, maybe that's one of the good ways we could be using our time, <laughs> yes, yes. is let's try to build some human connections mm -hmm. that, that bridge some of those gaps, because I think otherwise, by its own, it's going to just expand them. Yeah, thank you. Go ahead, please. So, so my field is quantum computing. I started my quantum computing research in 1998, already um, you know, twenty some years ago, and uh, this technology is still ahead. Of, uh, you know, some near future, but still not not being used <coughs> fully yet. So, so our interest is to um, increase or improve or develop a computer that actually take into all sorts of the state of art, quantum computing, AI, state of art uh, computing using. Uh, Silicon chips, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, so we KO University are putting so much effort now to put all these different technologies together to advance the field of computing. And this is a uh, this is very int uh, interesting in a way that it's a very interdisciplinary um, material scientists, computer electrical engineers, physicists, computer scientists, mathematicians. They all get together, even chemists, because they are interested in quantum chemistry and so on. So um, I think this is, a, this is a very exciting and interesting field. And this is something that the students are very interested in and pursue. And of course, you know, that will trickle down to building business models and so on. So that's, a, that's okay. something that uh, we should pursue. OK, thank you. So then, uh, Brian, please. So the democratization of uh, AI benefits, uh, I don't think it's going to happen on its own. I think it's going to require uh, a concerted effort. Mm -hmm. There's some obvious places where universities like these, which are some of the top research universities in the world, can help. Um, one thing is for our own agenda of reaching into diverse communities and actually working in the, you know, the K through 12 space and giving people from backgrounds which normally would not have access to advanced classes, uh, mm -hmm. programs through AI that can help elevate people. And that's something we can do. But we have to realize there's not going to be a <laughs> It's not going to happen through capitalism because these people don't have the money to pay. The people who have the money to pay are the children of rich parents who want mm -hmm. to do the best to get themselves into Oxford or whatever. And it's a perennial problem we all have. So that's going to require some sort of governmental program. And there's a real opportunity. 
at the university level, we have to understand it's a very heterogeneous group. You've got city colleges, which often are catering to students who are commuting in, working, and AI will do kind of what the, 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 the professors in those colleges do right now. So they're gonna have to make a transition very quickly. Mm. And that is hard. And so we always talk about, you know, the Luddites. Well, the reality is the Luddites were in a bad way for 75 years. And after 75 years, they found their jobs again. Mm -hmm. And I'm worried that the whole uh, higher education uh, pyramid could get hollowed out at the bottom, where that ecosystem is undermined uh, because it can't adapt fast enough to deal with the emergence of the technology, just like it's going to happen in accounting and legal and everything else. Mm -hmm. And that could end up hurting us because we kind of rely on that uh, as, as part of our ecosystem. Oh, OK. Thank you. Yeah. Well, then, uh, I just want to follow up from what Brian has said. Yeah. The, if left alone, I, I think it is very hard for us to find an equilibrium point. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, because you're going to see like what Paul pointed out, there will be one group, a very small group, that would make tremendous advancement, tremendous leverage. But majority would actually be hovering uh, at the don't know what to do, you know, what if I do sort of a situation. And, and uh, I do think that universities play a very key role. <laughs> Uh, uh, we have many top universities that are actually working on this problem. Uh, if we can actually form a common platform, all right, for us to reimagine education, uh, start with higher education, and then we go down, you know, to upstream. Uh, reimagine higher education. Uh, I think with the advent of AI, mm -hmm. uh, that is something which I think uh, many of the universities here can do. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And Irene, please. Yeah, I mean, I've not really very much to add. I mean, from what I agree with everything my, my colleagues have said. Um, I think maybe just an additional point. You know, this, this is very different, having said it's not different on the technological. You know, if you go back to your printing press mm. analogy, of course, that was just, you know, a, a great way of disseminating information. Mm. The difference here is, of course, it's generating content and it's creating content right. and it's learning. But the very mechanisms by which often it's doing it is through learning mechanisms, which is, of course, what we're all about as as our brains, how we learn. I'm a neuroscientist, so that's sort of, you know, germane to my background. And then that's what we do in our institutions. So the worry I guess I have going down is is maybe for large majorities of people is the, the utter dependency and trust and maybe removal from getting engaged with those learning opportunities of it. And and then just having sort of an abdication, if you like, of responsibility. Mm -hmm. and, and that's quite a worrying place potentially to get to, um, which could happen quite quickly. So whilst we are using it as an amazing tool to get out there in community colleges, you know, we have this amazing continuing education department that's been going for 150 years, everybody from 18 to 80 coming and learning remotely. Mm -hmm. You know, it's going to hugely enhance, you know, what we're doing there. But do we end up with a place, as you say, where you're hollowed out, Brian, the bottom, and people just trust then everything yeah. that's going there, when the importance of this to work is the, the validity of the data, the veracity of what the content is, et cetera. And I think that is a real challenge for us, because this, this does pose something different yeah. um, to some of the other technological advances that we've had to deal with. I think it does mean that we have to really rethink what is the size yeah. and shape question around higher education. Yeah. And it's not just higher education, it's the whole pipeline of education right. from primary school through. And that, you know, that's not bad to be disrupted a bit and to say, you know, is there just a new different way we want to <coughs> teach us as social animals uh, to learn content and to continue to learn and to live together yeah. in a very, very fast learning environment where we've got this thing alongside us that's learning with us and learning about us. And, and that is exciting, but it probably does challenge us to think a yeah. little bit differently about how, how right. we've built our model, which is not necessarily being built on a structure where that exists, and that's different. For now, yes, okay. Thank you so much. That's uh, very important for us to, I mean, reimagine re the, the educational system. At the same time, we, we need to be, uh, I mean, we need to take responsibility for, uh, I mean, all the trust and, uh, I mean, the grand, grounding truth. So. Uh, well, then I would like to uh, take the, <laughs> the question from the floor. Maybe, okay, jump. So in the middle, and then, yeah, 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 yeah. Check. And then, uh, yeah, you, you can pass uh, over the, the mics. 
Thanks so much for this great panel. Uh, I'm Jonas. I work also in higher education for software developers. I would be curious if and if yes, in what way you changed the way to uh, you conduct exams or any form of uh, tests in the past 12 months. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks so much. Incredibly interesting panel. Thanks for the amazing thoughts. So for me, it's, it's more of a comment, but I would love just maybe one or two reflections on it. Um, Like I see that there are three levels, so the dissemination of knowledge, so this is for the public, and this, I think, uh, generative AI would be amazing in getting the average or the high average mm -hmm. available information. I say this because I tested it, and always an expert would be better than the high average, because an expert is above the high average. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Then the second part, which in higher education, uh, so uh, vocational or people who do an uh, or apprenticeship model, like medicine, nursing, other areas, where actually don't learn log actually don't learn logic and critical thinking to produce, but rather skills to do things. Here also, it's amazing use case, again, to train on the high average. So the question here, if we want, this is what we want, or we want to push it further to go to the expert mm -hmm. level. And then last, which is the last point, I swear, it's the, uh, what I consider the highest level of the higher education, which is philosophy of science in general. And I, would, I did medicine, I did international relations, and I did global health um, degree studies. And I have to say, in all of these, I had to change how I think. And I tried to, okay, I'm really impressed, for example, by uh, when, I re when I first read a social uh, studies. Sure, please yeah. make it short. Sorry, sorry, I, I would say, <laughs> but I tried to make a tree of thought prompting, which is a way of prompting that you actually ask yeah. multiple questions, the questions lead to more questions, and I tried to push ChatGPT to the max where it actually make a complex thought. Yeah. It's not there. And it won't be there automatically in the sense of the increased parameters and so on. So how can we actually think of the last, uh, like, like the limitations and take it beyond? Yeah. Thanks. Okay, yeah. I Then, uh, I oh, yeah. okay, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, so I'm a current student, and uh, I uh, I am also studying uh, philosophy and data science. So, yeah. So I have a question for the uh, principals of the university. So what do you think? Um, I observed that there's more and more and more people studying data science technologies because of the trend. But at the same time, I, I see the funding for humanities and I mean liberal arts such as uh, Yale and US colleges shut down uh, a few years ago. Um, uh, so what do you think the universities or you guys as leaders role are in uh, in this trends of going more towards technology instead of humanities and only to mm. find out after you graduate that the tech mar like the big tech market <laughs> job market is not that good so <laughs> yeah okay. thank you so much well so yeah, we stop here and then uh, so I take two maybe, yeah so so, oh, so, okay. so, so you, question yeah. number two yeah. we have a, who could uh, yeah I, I'll, I'll just come to the last one there yeah. we are going to expand our humanities <laughs> not uh, contract and and, and uh, you know I, in a university that has all the different disciplines and different ways of thinking we finding that for example example, a number of people are doing what you're doing. They're, they're doing data science and, uh, and they're, they're, the and could vary, but very, for very many of them, it's actually in the humanities. Uh, and uh, I actually think the needs for it will only expand. So uh, I'll be completely contrarian to yeah. that perspective, you know, to the perspective you were worried about. Okay, so go ahead. So, so, yeah. so, so okay, yeah. uh, answer number two. Yeah. Um, so, so we have a university hospital, and our radio expert radiologists are much better, far better than uh, the state of art in AI to, to find cancers, for example, uh, seeds of cancers and so on. And they have to stay like that. Otherwise, AI will take over. But we, we have a confidence that, that they will stay on top of the uh, AI. But you know, when you actually screen so many people, then uh, radio, those expert uh, uh, radiologists don't have enough time to go through all the, all the, all the CT scans and so on. So in that sense, uh, it's important for us to have basic systems to scan everything and you know, just, to have the, just to keep the minimum of the you know, health check and so on. And then if there's something happens, or then you know, we could move on to the expert system. That, that might be the way to go. Also, uh, in the AI space that we, I introduced to you at KU University, uh, students are getting together to really push the prompt engineering. 
So, so, and all together with the prompt engineering experts we have. So this is a very interesting uh, experiment that we're having. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, just oh, can I, okay. maybe okay. just a quick response yeah. that yeah. Uh, uh, the closing down of Yale and US is not because of lack of funding for humanities. <laughs> uh, actually, what we did uh, at NUS was that we took the curriculum framework of Yale and US and extended it to the whole university. So we formed the College of Humanities and Sciences. We formed the College of Design and Engineering and using the Yale and US uh, uh, curriculum framework. Uh, and because now the whole university adopts the framework, there's actually no need for Yale and US to have their special sort of uh, uh, uniqueness as a standalone college. Um, just to echo a little bit um, what Paul said on the uh, humanities. So one of the challenges we have are uh, ultimately most of us are get a lot of funding from our governments, and the governments, for whatever reason, have decided humanities are bad, uh, tech is good. But we tend to ourselves, I mean, I would say it's a U.S. government flaw as well. Oh, well, I know that government. <laughs> right, so our independence. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So we, we, we do a lot to keep this humanities. And you know, we offer double degrees. And we find that our humanities students who are uh, also very uh, quantitatively capable do exceptionally well in the job market. With respect to assessment, um, assessment is changing. But our professors are slow to change. So we are emphasizing uh, scalable, continuous assessments and things that help on mental health, but also help avoid the issues around a chat GPT issue in the middle of an exam. Uh, but I would say there's a, a range of pedagogies we're experimenting with. But my main limit is convincing my professors that this is a reasonable way to go, mm -hmm. because they've been doing it this way for 50 years. And Gosh darn it, that's the right way to do it. Okay. Yeah, and yes. maybe just to add, I mean, I think, I think even more, uh, you're right, there are places where there is a threat to the humanities for all the reasons that Brian has, yeah. has detailed and, and others. Um, and hopefully you're reassured that certainly in our institutions, against that rhetoric, uh, we're doing everything to go against. So in Oxford, we're creating, in fact, a new huge centre funded by T. Schwartzman for the humanities uh, and to actually make a very bold statement with a brand new building that's going to house all our humanity students. So even more important now with this technology is it for us to understand what it is to be human, and that's what the humanities do. So we have to understand ourselves and understand what it is to be human, and that's going to become even more pressing. Having said that, I do think the humanities students need to be tech-savvy, and they need to learn something. So I think, again, we'll all have different uh, models to help enhance and skill up uh, <coughs> what will be important. Um, skills to have, yeah. uh, whether you're going to be humanities-based students, and vice versa. I often joked as a scientist, I was running more of an English language lab than I was a science lab because of the inability for scientists to communicate well and write <laughs> well. So again, <laughs> starting today, in fact, in Oxford, there's a new course that we're running to make sure humanities students understand a bit of maths, and the scientists now understand how to write, and they're going to do it through the lens of climate. So they're going to learn something about climate, and they're going to skill up. Um, on the assessment side, I mean, just as a joke to lighten up things, um, we were very grateful that in Oxford we haven't moved on, and we still write our answers. So when <laughs> ChatGPT came, like, thank God, nobody sits with a computer. Although, having said that, we did bring some computer assessments in. It's a challenge, uh, and I think yeah. we're all aware of the difficulties and, um, and, <clears throat> and the risks that come with that. And so we're just trying to adapt very quickly as to how we do our assessments to make sure that the student yeah. and the employers who are going to take the students know that when that student gets that class of degree that really does reflect the intellectual quality of that student because that's so important for the trust that you have in us and the product that we produce in terms of the talent pool and in terms of the expert thing I mean I think quite quickly there'll be things that we'll just beat and I think you know medics shouldn't be threatened by that um, I mean if I just say maybe differently in radiology I think quite quickly already there will be algorithms I'm a neuroimaging background person which will read out much better with much better resolution than a tired radiologist 11 o'clock at night is going to miss something don't be threatened by that. Yeah, sure, you don't need to do that. So you're going to learn new ways of doing chemical neuroimaging and other ways that will enhance you know, new techniques that will give you a new skill set for you as a radiologist. So you're evolving. It's all about evolution. Mm -hmm. Just quickly, you know, we have been witnessing sharp increase in philosophy major since the emergence of the chat GPT. Mm -hmm. uh, I asked them why, and they said, you know, we have to, we have to be human. So that's, uh, oh, yeah. that's apparently <laughs> the case for our university. Right. I just want to add a, a, a statement. Uh, uh, I think COVID has actually changed universities a lot. 
Yeah. Uh, I can see the difference that in the past of when our professors asked them to use digital tools and this, many will say no. But COVID sort of forced us, forced every one yeah. of them, all right, uh, yeah. to, be, to use digital tools. And after COVID, I think many are very comfortable. Mm -hmm. So getting them to record <coughs> and all this uh, uh, is simple stuff. I think they were amenable. Likewise, I think in terms of SMS assessments, I see that they have also become more flexible. But I guess the problem is that uh, just when we have recovered from COVID, it came chat GPT. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. a, a, a bit too fast. Okay, all right. So uh, then, uh, so I would like to ask ask you a uh, kind of final remarks if you have uh, <laughs> something to say at the end, and then. Well, maybe. We, I, so oh, maybe there's uh, a there's more questions. No, questions. So just yeah, so we yeah could take one questions. Yeah. Teru, maybe you should answer some of them. Right, right, right. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, Alexander Jansky from University of Zurich. I'm the team leader of innovation and digital education. And I think we are all agree that we cannot ban um, generative AI from education. But we know that there are like the big tech companies behind that. And our one, I heard a lot of chat GPT, and I think most universities are using GPT in Azure or some GPT-based um, thing. And I'm just wondering, what are your thoughts about the invasion of these companies in education and educa educational systems? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's another one. OK. So then uh, so we stop there. So please. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, this is extremely interesting. I have a question uh, regarding um, the disruption potential um, by the market. So how do you assess uh, the market forces able to disrupt the education system? Um, so in generating automatically new uh, content uh, with you know, learning capability created, personalized uh, material for students, and um, yes. All right, so yeah. Uh, okay, just a couple of quick and you know, so, so GP, you mentioned GPT and, and you know, the, the tech companies and on, but I will, you know, if you recall the example I gave way at the beginning, it was the uh, AlphaFold. And, and, and for the vast majority of work inside universities, actually, um, on, the, on, the knowledge, on, the, on the knowledge creation end, uh, it's actually really the questions are, how are we creating data sets that are specialized for answering important questions? And that's how our students are learning about how to think about things in deeper ways. So, uh, you know, I mean, obviously, it's, that's a broader societal issue, but I would say, you know, in the kind of knowledge creation side of things, uh, I'm a little bit less concerned that that's a, a huge issue um, uh, from, my, from my perspective. I forget, what was the second question? I, maybe somebody else wants to answer the second question. I, I can pass this answer to Teruo. Oh, okay, but, but I, I'm, I mean, sort of uh, resonating with the uh, poll. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, then, yes, yeah. I agree. Yeah. Over the, yeah. yes. Like uh, the, the big techs are behind, but uh, still, I mean, the knowledge is. Cre I mean, we are kind of the the institutions that creating knowledge. So that uh, so we so it's uh, there's always a discussion around also also all these. I mean, big publishers and also how we could deal with all this journal uh, charging and then we so we we have to pay a kind of huge amount of money for for uh, reading it in a digital form. But uh, but that, that there's always a kind of discussion in between so that uh, we need to find a way in a kind of a broader scope in a society how to share all this knowledge. So that's my yes, comment. So I think you'll find most of the universities here and probably University of Zurich, we try not to tend, uh, tie ourselves to specific technologies and groups. <coughs> and I think we have a, there's gonna be an ethical issue that's gonna emerge as the data sets behind ChatGPT would not, I think, pass our, our uh, ethics uh, groups and so how do we deal with that so I think there's going to be a set of conversations and a movement to something that's hopefully truly open and something that uh, fits our ethical values with respect to our future business model all of us are always thinking about how are we not going to be disintermediated by this technology. I will say it's relatively easy for this group of universities. I'm much more worried about universities down further in the pyramid, and, and there are some serious questions there that I fortunately don't have to answer. Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think if you look at the current uh, narrative, it's actually mainly shaped by the tech companies. All right, they have huge amount of data, huge amount of resources, huge amount of computing power. All right, um, and uh, it's great if, let's say, they do something like what Google DeepMind has done. All right, for Alpha Four, mm -hmm. uh, but I think not every use case uh, uh, is so altruistic. Uh, 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 many are actually profit-driven, right? And I think uh, the wider society has to be able to seize uh, the, the chance to make a different narrative. Uh, and I think universities are in position to do that, yep. right? To, to reshape the narrative. Yep. Uh, currently, I think uh, it's too, uh, I would say, uh, one-sided. Okay, so there's, yeah, maybe uh, final comments, yeah? So mine will be relatively quick. I, yeah. I just want people to leave with a feeling that the, you know, that the aspect of the mission of the universities to actually create new knowledge and to, cre and to foster people who are able to do that um, is going to be lifted <laughs> enormously. And we're going to see, and, and of course, we, we need to be working hard to make sure that ethics and judgment and you know, good policy and so on are coming into that. But the big uh, trend will be, I think, for uh, if we come back, look 10 years down the road, we will have seen that the ability to know new things will be astonishing. And I think overall, it will come to enormous benefit. Yes, please. OK. Yeah. So as, as research universities, we should always uh, be using the state-of-the-art um, tools uh, that are available to us. But at the same time, it's very important for our so, uh, social scientists and other colleagues to, be, to get involved so that, that the we, they also understand the current status so that the, they can actually come up with better, I don't know, <coughs> ethics or other, um, other model to 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 have to have better usage in a healthy way thank you thank you so i think uh the universities like up here are going to create a new generation of students and researchers who are supercharged who can use this technology to you know boost productivity uh, quite dramatically. I do think we will also have the means to think about how to make it inclusive, but ultimately it's going to require governments to go through and drive the inclusion because it's not going to happen naturally and that has to be a big focus of ourselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I, we feel that there are tremendous opportunities to leverage on AI, right? But of course there are also significant risks and fragmentation. All right. If, let's say, we do not actually provide uh, enough sort of uh, uh, guardrails uh, and uh, pay attention on attack, ethics and many other aspects. Uh, but this actually requires us to work together. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So hopefully you can uh, sense there's enormous optimism around it, which, which again, I think uh, we all share across the sector. It would be great to do this in five years' time just to see whether some of our predictions are right and just how quickly it's all evolved there. Um, we've spoken a lot about truth and knowledge being the sort of hallmarks of what a university is. We don't own the knowledge. I mean, historically we did because it sat in our libraries and that's why you had to come right. to university to take the book out to learn. And of course that changed with the internet and etc. So I'm very comfortable that knowledge should continue to be democratised and out there. But the truth question becomes even more important and ground truth becomes really yeah. important yes. as we all question the validity of the content which is of course what we want so again notwithstanding your point from the University of York absolutely most of us are keeping a, a distance in terms of the companies uh, so that we can be pure if you like about where we challenge things but we are going to have to work probably more effectively together in order to make sure that the shaping of that content and the the sort of ground truth element of it is there. Uh, and so that will be something I think additional just to, to comment from what has already been said and I fully agree with. Well, okay, uh, th thank you so much. So this would uh, conclude this session and uh, I, I, I think uh, we, we need to I mean, keep discussing on the, what will be the kind of uh, uh, the, uh, the next generation uh, higher education and so on and hope we could continue on uh, this kind of discussion in the next occasion. So uh, please join me to thank all the speakers. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs>